Hey, and welcome to TSOB. This is a podcast for entrepreneurs who are interested in investing or starting their own funds. We are Adam Anderson and Zach Eikenberry. Join us to get a behind the scenes look at the relationships between founding entrepreneurs and the VCs that invest in them. Hey, Zach. Adam. I enjoy constantly getting better at this craft with you. Um, what I've discovered is I need a better camera because sometimes I go real dark and then it's like real bright. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Anyway, it's good times. Good times. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. It is a full day for me oh. here at Hook Security. What's your yeah. day? Uh, I got to go swimming. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, take it, I'll take it as a metaphor, but also just no, like, no, I got for a bath. No, I've got to go. Um, I got to get back in shape. i uh, the the care and feeding we do to ourselves when we're in the middle of the startup world and when we're in the middle of starting funds and all this stuff. I have intentionally. I even knew I was doing it. I knew I was doing it. And I was like. I'm uh, not going to be taking care of myself for the next two years because I know I can't boil the ocean and I something had to give. And so what I chose to get a couple hours back every day was nutrition, exercise and good sleep. I just sacrificed all that so I can work more hours. Uh, nothing went faster, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> I just worked on more projects that didn't move forward. So. I knew the math was wrong, but in, you know, I just had, I had, I told myself that I had to do it. And so now uh, I have to un, undo all that. I'm going sailing in January and I don't want to be a, uh, I don't want to be uncomfortable. I don't care about washboard abs, but I do want to be able to, you know, jump around a boat and pool rigging and, you mm. know, so. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You know, I'm i I'm on a similar journey too, where I decided not to decide about what I ate and what I did yep. physically exercise wise. And so over the past three months, I've actually started uh, caring again. And huh. I'll, I'll tell you what, this is my mind shift. This is not about uh, two stones, but sure it uh, is. <laughs> I, I decided that for the rest of my life, I'm just going to be somebody who exercises mm -hmm. I, the mental clarity that I get the next day or two after a really great workout. And I, I'm in the orange theory cult mm -hmm. um, is beyond. I can't, I can't describe just how much, and it has nothing to do with physical appearance for me. It is all mental health. That's now, fantastic. I am just as unattractive as I've ever been. Oh yeah. I was going to say, I couldn't tell that you actually have been doing anything for the last three months, but then I was like, that's not supportive. You do look a little bit more, I don't know, glowy. It looks oh. like you're happy and that's coming out through your skin. That's oh, shucks. <laughs> happy skin. Shucks. <laughs> this episode brought to you by, I don't even happy know. Skin. <laughs> anyway. Happy skin. Anyway. Happy skin. As seen on Shark Tank. <laughs> that's right. Do you have sad skin? Oh my gosh, that's horrible for you. You'll never close a deal or raise money with sad skin. Get happy skin. And maybe someone will write you a freaking check. Speaking of writing checks um, and self-care, uh, we were talking before the uh, we started recording and the whole idea of who's got your back and what does that look like and what is the role of the VC in having the back of the entrepreneur and all that jazz um you, you you triggered a couple things one of them was i get approached by people who say hey can i grab a cup of coffee hey can i share my idea with you hey can i and i love that so much it's one of my favorite things to do in the world but now that i'm wearing this vc hat there's like an undercurrent of every conversation where i feel like i'm being sold to and that this isn't supposed to be fun anymore. I'm sharing my idea with you, Adam, not because you're fun to talk to. And gosh, isn't this entrepreneurial thing that we're all in great. It's I'm sharing my idea with you because I want you to write a check one day. And the joy in ideation is beginning to die. Like, I'm like, I don't want to hear your idea because it's not fun anymore. Because I know you're going to ask for a check. 
Uh, mm-hmm. And the defense mechanism I use is be very, very clear with what we invest in, why we invest and what our thesis is. And I try to only ideate uh, with people. But the, the, what I'm discovering, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Most entrepreneurs don't understand how VC works. And so they hear you're a venture capitalist or they hear you're somebody who does investments and they just think that means anybody's fair game. And they don't understand that if I'm not in your industry, if I don't understand what you're doing, it's actually not, there's like zero chance I'm going to invest in you because I can't, because I've told people who gave me money what I'm going to do with that money. So anyway, uh, I was wondering if you would like to rift a little bit about who's got your back. Um, and maybe we talk a little bit about the entrepreneur VC relationship, but also outside of that relationship. Yeah, I think, I think you bring up an interesting point, first of all, and we've touched on it before that. It's an interesting, wait, 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 is it an interesting point? Because I just repeated what you said before the call. And now you're like, good point, Adam. Thanks for stealing my thunder. Some smart person said that just five minutes ago, you jackass. (laughs) I, I think, I think we, what I remember before the call was agreeing not to have the same backdrop. Yeah. So that people would think that we are brothers and that I was the younger prodigal son. Yeah, I might. I don't know if I don't do something, you might be looking like grandpa. <laughs> this is my, this is my the young whippersnapper I can bury. I got the gray hairs. So the, so the, the point that you make is that by and large the VCs are actually downhill from the LPs, right? Mm-hmm. That what the limited partner wants to see invested in is what the VC is going to invest in. Yep. And so you're actually not talking to a real person. You're talking to some sort of animated uh, puppet of the LP, right? That's a, that's a very crude way to talk about it, but to understand that that's what's happening. And then the other thing that's very interesting to me is, and this goes both ways, and this is what I was actually riffing on, the idea that the... VC, the investor, Hmm. largely discounts the uh, entrepreneur's experience to zero unless they've done it before. Correct. So if this is your first time raising money, your first time uh, trying to build out a significant company with outsized returns, they're going to look at you and say, well, your experience is relatively zero. Smart people. Right. Great idea. The way Wonderful. the way that it's the, the way that the inside baseball is played now is if you go to Harvard or Stanford MBA, you prob- or a computer science degree from Stanford, you're probably going to get towards the top, and they they won't discount it completely to zero. But it's that. Now, on the other hand, entrepreneurs, by and large, especially the ones who have done it before, when they talk to a VC, if that VC hasn't performed through an exit, doesn't help in the upper mm-hmm. rounds, etc they will also get discounted to zero. So you the VC end up with, gets discounted to zero. Oh yeah. The VC is, why would I want your advice on this? Why would I take your input? Mm. You don't know my industry. You don't know. <laughs> so you end up with these commercial transactions that are just that. There, there's very little passion on both sides because both sides are not respecting the other's uh, point of view experience um, what they can do other than you you need my money i have your money type mm-hmm. thing yep so um which which i think is where you were going with the ideation and the passionlessness because the the flip side is actually not that attractive either where you're you're talking to incredibly needy entrepreneurs who are there they they disc- they don't discount your experience they overestimate it they go, oh, well, that's, that's hard to. I mean, I'm yeah, kind yeah. of a big deal. <laughs> maybe, maybe your experience are yeah, overestimated. Well, yeah, they look at you and say, like, you are, you're just on this pedestal. You're way up there. I can't wait to, in the, the amount of like energy that they bring to that conversation is yeah. outsized. And now all of a sudden, what what's interesting to me is I've watched a few young entrepreneurs do this recently. Mm-hmm. So, Play the game out. You approach a VC and you put them on a pedestal and you tell them how smart they are, et cetera. 
what does that VC do now in that relationship? I must now you have, you. yeah, I now have a mentor mentee. I have a parent child relationship mm-hmm. now with this person. So now uh, what's more important than my money is my advice. What's, what's more important is my time. And I'm mm. going to give you that and we're mm. going to get somewhere. And now the entrepreneur is trapped because they, yeah, again, they took that experience and that point of view from the VC and they put it to 2X what it really is. So rather than both sides thinking of themselves accurately, which is my definition of humility, mm-hmm. um, you know, you end up with these really lopsided relationships. And I'm, I'm seeing that now in a couple of companies that I've worked with in my tertiary part of the world, where they're working with venture capitalists who are, they're not as knowledgeable as they're uh, promoted to be. And it's, yeah. it's not, it's not setting them up for long-term success. So those are my three points that we were talking about. That's, those are all so good. You, you actually, it's like you just find a wound that I've just had and you start poking it, right? And so just yesterday, I'm on a call with this amazing entrepreneur. He's got a little professional services company in healthcare and brain science and all this stuff. And he's doing this great stuff. And he's, he's onto something. And he wants to know, how do I raise money? Like, that's the question I keep getting is like, please do the entire strategic plan of my race. And so it's almost like they, he doesn't understand the complexity of the question he just asked, right? Which is great, because if he did, he probably would be terrified and didn't do it. But, hey, help me raise money. And so I'm on the phone with this guy for, an, oh, I guess, 45 minutes. And I'm repeating the same thing over and over again. If you don't have customers go get a pre-order go do the sales you see yes don't kill your current business because you need cash flow and also no one's going to invest in your current business so you have to go do this up and i think after saying the same thing the same three points over and over again you got to get some kind of customer who wants to give you money and he had the um i think he had medicare be like oh you're just too small but when you get this big when you get large enough we're absolutely in so that's gold. That's gold. You want to write that down, get a non-binding letter of intent that says those words because that shows customers are interested in you. But you keep talking about your product. You keep talking about. And so I think another part of this is that um, when you put a entrepreneur on, a, I mean, I'm sorry, you put the VC on a pedestal and you're talking about this advice stuff, or I guess it could even be vice versa. Um there, there's the assumption, if you think I am so great that I'm beginning to figure out, you won't understand the advice I give you anyway. And so, hey, how do I raise money becomes a warning bell of you are literally going to eat up the rest of my life because you're, it's just so much time to teach a person how to do this stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And I... I'm finding myself running away. I'm finding myself from, Hey, how do you raise money? I'm like, um, I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Go find that, out here. Yeah. That's right. I don't know who said it, it might've been Paul Graham, but it might've been Ricky another, Bobby, another one of those famous VCs. I'm trying to remember, but the, they said, you know, most VCs brag about how many investments their fund has made, but they said over the course of a lifetime, a venture capitalist, if they start in their 20s and retire in their 60s, okay, they are going to make somewhere between 40 and 60 investment calls for themselves. That's it. Hmm. That's it. And in that range, they need to hit home runs. Yeah. Because the, their time is the same as everybody else's time. And what what ends up happening is what separates that one percent of investors and venture capitalists, you know, hedge fund managers, all those folks, uh, from F- the ninety nine percent is not like the ninety nine percent can still be making returns, but these folks here picked the entrepreneur, the idea, and the timing. Yep, and they got all three of those things right. Yep, and that's the that's the hard part because you only have so many deals to nurture in your lifetime period yeah you're you're and so you're looking at right now uh what you're in your mid-20s adam 
So yeah, yeah mid twenties, forty five ish, <laughs> forty five. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say you you VC and invest for twenty more years. Okay. Cool. You your fund might invest in a hundred, two hundred, depending on your follow on funds, etc. Adam Anderson as part a material part of those deals. What twenty? I would hope for ten. Uh, yeah. Ten ten calls. That's what you yeah. get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um. What I have been discovering is that there is no shortage of enthusiastic entrepreneurs that are on to something. And I told this guy yesterday, I was like, I trust that you have the skill sets to do the things you told me to do that you're going to do. I trust that you have uh, the ability to create the science that's going to help people. What you have to prove to me is that you can build a business that brings your solution to a customer for an exchange of money. And if you can't do that, then it doesn't matter how amazing and how wonderful what you have is because no one will ever get to see it. And so if you can't talk to me about that stuff, like I, that's what I want to hear when I'm talking to someone to get my attention. If I got to make 10 calls, 20 calls, and you don't lead with, I've got these customers who are just wildly excited about this thing that I'm doing. And what I need is a little bit of money to get going on this project um, to validate what I already know before we go and raise a series A or series B. Oh, yes. Thank you. That's what I needed to hear. That's what I needed to hear. Uh, and then of course you have the due diligence process where we ask you to prove what you just said. Um, but, you know, the, the thing that I like about the 1020 is I don't want to just invest money in an entrepreneur. I mean, we spend a disproportionate amount of time together uh, due to that bet you lost. Uh, hmm. But the... I thought you weren't supposed to bring that up. Oh. Is that, I, it's part of our non-disclosure. So no, 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 no. I think no, you've no, tripped you... over it. So now no. I'm allowed to tell people exactly what you did. No, that you're talking about the restraining order. I can't bring that up. Oh, I get confused. <laughs> That's so, so many, so many <laughs> barriers, right? <laughs> but the the if he, a human being only has the bandwidth to work really, really closely with a handful of other human beings over a course of a, a lifetime, and I don't want to make hundreds of investments and then turn it into a numbers game. That's not the kind of VC game I want to play. I, I believe that venture capital exists to invest in companies that are going to literally change the world. And the number one risk of a venture failing is the entrepreneur burning out. And so to me, it's very, very important as somebody who's a capital allocator to make sure that the person I'm giving money to has great support structures, has a supporting family, has people who back them, have people around them who support them, because it is going to get hard. And it is even if you're absolutely happy and perfect in front of me right now, five years is going to happen pretty quick and you're going to get worn down and eventually you'll get an orange theory addiction. And you know, wait, we're not talking about what like, anyway, I'm moving on. But that's the thing. It's like I talk about me. I'm my favorite subject. Fair. Fair. So, so, so how did you, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about your support structure? Who are the people in your life that, um, you know, kind of have your back, right? One of the, one of, I mean, yeah. you can start with me and tell me how great I am, but I feel like you should probably move on from there pretty quickly. Okay. Off you go. That, that's right. Like, um, I think I shared a LinkedIn post by Jason Limkin with you, which is, uh, essentially boiled down to if you want to make it as a SaaS company, the do the things your competitors won't, right? Mm -hmm. And had this whole list. And at the end of the list was upgrade your mentors. Yeah. And so I've been thinking a lot about that. I can tell you that I have a gap in my mentor system, as mm -hmm. in there's a group of mentors who have helped me to get to where I am currently. Uh, that's between an executive coach, a few masterminds, a couple of individuals that, you know, I reach out to and I maintain the relationship and that's mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. I don't expect reciprocity with all my mentors as in like, Oh, they never reach out to me and proactive. I don't care. 
there are no. people I I just bring them ideas, issues, etc. And the more specific I can be with what I would like to process with them, the better the relationship is. Um, and you know, I have vicarious mentors through uh call it certain number of blogs I follow, podcasts that I listen to, and books mm-hmm. that I read. Right. So the, that would be my support network. And I, I don't discount the books I read and the podcasts I listen to to zero. Like those actually have impact as a mentor mm-hmm. to me. The gap um, is interesting because I also have a couple of mentors that are five, 10 years ahead of me that process and see the world completely different. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of what they talk about in blind spots for me, or I've never previously experienced. So it's hard for me to relate other than to use my imagination. Right. They, they talk to me all the time about like, okay, so when you win the lottery, da, 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 da. And I go, <laughs> wait, what? And they're like, yeah. Cause if you continue to do this set of behaviors over time, you will emerge as a lottery winner. And I'm, I'm incredulous because I've never experienced that. Right. So there's a gap in that space right now where I'm reaching forward to upgrade mentors and I have a lot of trouble asking them questions because I don't know which questions to ask them. I don't know how to approach their mindset. I don't know what a proper use of their time and resources is and is not. And so um, that's where I'm at in my support journey. Um, But I would say um, one of my favorite things thus far at Hook is to actually give a shout out to you because you provide a very safe and interesting, I say interesting, you provide a safe and uh, encouraging space to bring you ideas, questions. And there are plenty of times where you ask me, wait a second, are you asking for advice? Are you asking for uh, me to just listen? What what are you asking for here? So Mm -hmm. um, that mentorship has changed absolutely how i ceo and build this company over the last four years at this point well that's freaking awesome (laughs) yeah i think that um you just made me think oh man first off thank you for those nice words second off i need better mentors like the whole idea of who's got your back you have your your uh, family who hopefully is supporting. You got friends who often don't understand what you do. And eventually all your friends become entrepreneurs, <laughs> which is sad. You, you either have high school friends that you share a long history with, and you're like having a saddled with them, or you have hobby friends, but most of your friends are entrepreneurs because you sit in a building or in a room. You're like, uh, I don't want to talk about anything else than your cash flow, Right. Uh, and then you've got these business mentors and what you outlined it can be very difficult to realize, how do I use a mentor? Like everyone says, how do I get a mentor? I'm like, most people are happy to mentor people, but what do you do once you get them? What's the relationship look like? Um, and when are you going to slow down enough to actually take it seriously to go upgrade your mentor network? Right? And like my dream would be to have somebody who've started multiple funds, who knows the game backwards and forwards, who has tight connections with LPs and understands all the stuff and just let me learn for 12 months. Like I, I would, uh, <laughs> I tried to shadow a, um, a Virgin group. Um, they were having a, a board meeting on, on Necker or near Necker. And I sent Peter a note. I was like, hey, can I be a board observer, just a silent board observer that sits there and just listens? I really want to learn how to be chairman of the board better. And I think watching you in action would be great. And the the laughter was not complimentary. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but that's the thing you have to try. Like, by the way, no, I did not get invited to go sit in the boardroom. It's apparently he's like, no, we don't do that. But yeah, you probably get into like the White House situation room a little easier than most you likely. Into, like a virgin group board meeting. <laughs> yeah, I did, you know, but I remember I know our board meetings and I'm we're cut, cutting <laughs> up, we're having a good time, but that is definitely a startup board that we've got going here. The virgin I, attorneys would 
wouldn't even allow anybody to speak yeah. until they figured out who Zoom bombed them and who Adam Anderson is. <laughs> 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 well, it was going to be in person, too. I think it was going to cost a pretty penny just for me to get there. But anyway, uh, I, you know, when you're thinking about who's got your back, doing some dreaming about what that would look like. And, and for me, I think what I desperately want is to work with somebody who is five to 10 years ahead of me and just learn because I don't know the, um, the conversations to have. Like when, when I'm talking to folks once every three months, I feel the pressure to come with good questions. Well, that's not how you learn. If, if your relationship with your mentor is only as good as the questions you know how to ask, then you will never grow at the pace necessary. What I believe needs to happen is that you've got to be able to hang out with a mentor who invites you into this journeyman master type of relationship where, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to let you see how I do what I do and you can learn by watching and listening. Mm -hmm. And eventually I'll even let you do a couple things and eventually you'll be ready to go off and do it yourself. So, yeah. Yeah. I, th I think one of the things that's underestimated about when you look at successful people and the people you would, want to emulate you know at some level mm -hmm. is not just the questions to ask them right it's the emulation of them it's the questions they ask yeah it's it's the word choice that they have right because you can only understand concepts in your mind that you have clear words for that's yep and, and so one of the reasons that you know you can skip past things when you say things, right? So mm -hmm. I just, I just said, I don't have a clear, when you want to skip past concepts, belief sets, et cetera, that are in the minds of the mentors, you just call them things. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a, a red flag to you. If you're like, Hey, I want to talk to you about some things. Okay. Well, you have no clarity on what you're, what you're asking. Um, and that had to do with word choice. Yeah. And my belief is that the people worth emulating either naturally or have learned how to identify ideas and concepts, relationships, and it, with actual words that are distilled down to a level that, uh, say, you know, a five-year-old could understand. That's how clear and deep they understand the nature of business, the transactions, the work that they're doing. When you right. listen to like a Richard Branson, he does not sound smart, but he sounds clear. He sounds accurate. He sounds <laughs> like a five, he could talk to a five-year-old about what Virgin's doing next in space. And that's the level that I'm attempting to upgrade is to figure out the words I'm not using and the words I don't know. And then how to emulate those in the form of questions and upgrade my question sets. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, the person's intelligence can be measured by the quality of their questions. And then the uh, reciprocals, um, so the side of that's true, where it's, if I'm asking you questions and you don't know how to play with this game that I'm having, then, you know, maybe we're not, we shouldn't be hanging out in this context. Um yeah, you, you, I'm super distracted right now. I'm like, who in the world could I upgrade my mentor with, mentorship with? Um, well, I th let's let's put a pin in this. I think we should come back in about three months and tell each other how we upgraded our mentor network. Hmm. And that that'll be a cool thing is to say, all right, we both know we needed to upgrade our mentor uh, community. What did that look like? How did we do it? I think that'd be super valuable. I'm going to write that down. Um, upgrade mentor. Who, how, and why? Three months. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, let, let's, let's pivot to one more thing. Um, you are going into a board meeting in a little bit. Um, why don't we check in on where we are with our various projects? Uh, I, uh, I'll go first. 
it's this LP journey of getting people to write checks for me has just been tough. Uh, every and it's just so slow. And I saw um, a buddy of mine, Merrill Johnson, said a thing on LinkedIn the other day where it was of the five major deals she's done um, that were large and outsized, they were all super easy. And the, uh, and the relationship was really easy because the person on the other side of the table really wanted it to happen. And then she's like, of the 20 other deals that I have struggled with and none of them closed, they've all been super difficult. And so she's like, I refuse to do hard things now. If the deal isn't easy and if there isn't an immediate fit, then we move on. And I think one of my lessons has been the reason why we sit and suffer through presentation and pitch after presentation and pitch with people who don't understand what we're doing and never will is because we have a scarcity mindset about the number of other human beings we could be talking to. Oh, you're the only LP in front of me. I got to get you. This is it. Or, oh, you're the only VC in front of you. So my big epiphany this you know, week in those last two weeks was I can do, you know, a number of things um, better. And one of those things is remove my scarcity mindset about the limited partners who want to invest in the things I'm doing and pivot that into an excitement of meeting more and more limited partners. So that's where I'm at. Um, mm -hmm. Where are you at? Yeah, I think that's one of the interesting things about doing business in Q3 2022 right now. So we are on the other side of whatever the Biden administration calls a recession, right? And <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm not going to make any more jokes along those lines. But the, the idea, I just talked to an attorney an hour ago, and she said, listen, she's been seeing term sheets just pulled left and right at the 11th hour, people leaving money on the table, good faith deposits, because you know, they do not, they do not have the energy and call it the love or the passion to see a deal through. Yeah. Right. And she said the only deal she's seeing through right now are the ones she wouldn't expect. Right. And I think it has to do with exactly what you're saying, which is um, working with people who on the other side have that X factor. Yeah. Who, who are driven to close a deal other than um, reducing it to a banking transaction because banking transactions have no trust. Yep. And so the, you continue to have to demonstrate that it's a good idea. And every minute up until it closes, everybody's looking for a reason to back out. Yep. And if you're looking for a reason to back out, you will. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the nature of our economy. Now, uh, what got deals done previously was just the, eternal optimism of even if this is a bad deal to work out because yep. even if i invest wrongly right now there's so much capital there's so much opportunity that we're in a supply side demand is so high like this will all work out we're not seeing that right now so when it comes to like raising money at a hook right what i have in front of me are three emerging scenarios and we are being encouraged that, hey, it might not make a lot of sense to raise any more money right now. And you once again just should get some intermediate financing and hold your breath until the world gets back to some sort of, you know, market average. Yep. And so that's one of the things we're wrestling with. Or we say, actually, we think it's the door is still open here. Here's a window. Let's run at it before things get worse. Yep. Right. Um, which no investor wants to hear that they think you're going to jump in with them and then immediately take a plummet in valuation and then head back up. But don't get on the that, roller coaster if you don't like the ride, man. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, that's that's the issue. These VCs would rather just sit, right? And so they, they're they getting their two and 20 and their 20 yeah. can wait. So they're getting their two and they sit there 
and they take they took a look at their current portfolio. They already know some people they're comfortable with. They deploy a little more capital into them. Mm -hmm. They push their uh, single and double base hit companies to exit so they yep. can write some money back to their LPs who get a little nervous when they need cash. And yep. that's what these VCs will probably be doing for a bit. And so at least that's the set of behaviors I assume will happen. Uh, so that's where we're at with Hook and what we're seeing in the market. It's also very interesting at our stage to believe so much in our growth that further leveraging debt might make sense versus equity raise. And that's another part of the equation that might end up happening if we defer our major round for another 18 months or so. That's interesting. That is interesting. I mean, this, this is why, I mean, uh, this is why it's so important to have people in your corner and have your back. The whipsaw of one day we're going to get $8 million and the next day, oh my gosh, we should raise debt to the next day. Oh wait, there's this person and they, they're going to come through for us. And the next, and then it's just like, there's a certain amount of chaos and there's a certain amount of fatigue that comes in when you're doing the chaos and you do the chaos really well. I've seen a lot of humans do the chaos and you do it well. And I, one of the things I think is one of your superpowers is your self-awareness and your willingness to take a break and to do some self-care. Um, and I don't know how you survive the whipsaw without the self-care. I don't know how you stay in the game without some kind of mental support because you have to turn around and look at all of your employees. So you just hired new employees and you got to turn around to your family who are like, Hey, we need to pay our mortgage and stuff. And you're like, I know I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm trying to get the money. Okay. But uh, we're going to continue to tell you the pain that we're in constantly so that you don't forget that we're in pain because we don't actually understand what the hell you do. So you must not be doing anything. And meanwhile, you're sitting there going, how do I, okay, I'm moving the chess pieces. Can you imagine someone trying to play chess, planning all the different moves ahead? And there's a guy standing behind him, like just bitching at him the whole time. It's like, <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to get in the car. Can we go? It's like, I got to win this chess game before we can get, I, we don't own the car yet, dude. No, no, come on. Yeah, yeah I, it's, it's probably... I thought you were going to go with the analogy that, you know, I'm sitting here playing chess, trying to plan all the moves ahead, win against all these other forces. And I have somebody behind us saying like, is the game over yet? Or what game, what, this is the dumbest game of checkers I've ever seen. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I gotcha. Like, I understand that until I die every month, I will have an electric bill. I understand that. Yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> Until I die. So leave me alone. I don't need to worry about that bill. It's going to ha it's going to come. It's going to go. I know it's been there. I've been adulting now for well, at least 18 years. So yeah. like I got this. Like you know, adding the pressure of putting something into the future that you can't control that will just be there anyway. Um doesn't all it does is it sours my present reality. Well, well it's a fear-based reaction from the people who stand behind you when you're playing the chess game and when they don't understand how chess is played mm -hmm. and they can't understand what you're doing. And so all they can do, it, it, it's a, the heavy part of this is that the people who work for you and the people who depend on you to produce a particular result don't have control and that results in fear and the reason they're afraid comes across as i don't trust zach because you can then say why the hell are you afraid haven't i gotten the money in every time haven't i mm -hmm. point at the track record where this you know fear you have is you know warranted and the the thing that annoys me is when I'm at the table and I'm playing chess and I've got all the things behind me and I've got people reminding me of all the stuff. Um, it's like 
don't you understand what I'm doing now? Now, the risk is us not turning around and validating that they need to go. Or the, mm-hmm. Let me rephrase that. The, uh, the risk is not turning around and validating the people who have fears about it and staying focused on the chess game. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've done that a lot in my day. And that will mean that no one's standing behind you and you're all alone. And if you win the game, it doesn't matter because yeah. there's no one to high five. That's right. Your your job is not to tell people behind you to go away, but yes. to bring them up into the chess game as much as they're willing to come, right? And so mm-hmm. to, like, I do, yesterday I was talking to another group of CEOs and I told them it's very uh, difficult for me because at that point in time yesterday afternoon, I had two hours where nothing was planned. And I said, I get concerned when there's downtime that I'm doing something wrong because I'm used to this constant state of emergency and it messes with your mind. You've been there before in previous companies where the bills were paid, people are doing their job and nothing is needed of you for some window of time. Right. And uh, you start to think, am I worth it? Am I doing, you know, and you want to get in and um, so Screw, screw everything up. Yeah. Because my job is to work through other people to get results. My job is not to get the results myself. I right. So I'm playing this chess game and maybe that's not the best analogy because people aren't the chess pieces, but to bring them along into the game so that there are multiple chess games happening in front of me mm-hmm. over and over again. And we're properly setting up the pieces and getting ready for the next game and the next game and the next game so that other people are playing. So eventually there's 10 chess games going on yeah. and, I, and I'm there, but there's still people behind me who will never play the game. I e. my family, et cetera, that I need to communicate what is happening in a mm-hmm. way that they understand it's my job to accommodate them. Yeah. And so um, that's part of the burden to bear. And that's why, you know, in the seat that I sit, compensation's different the equity participation's different because these are the challenges i take on right uh, if, if if i wanted a, a a very set domain with set hours set expectations pre preset templates of communicating mm-hmm. then then i would have that and yeah. would have a different compensation and equity level yep yep the uh yeah Oh, that that that's a good comment. We probably need to unpack uh, CEO compensation in a startup, uh, <laughs> a different episode. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, no, I mean, nobody's life is easy, mm-hmm. and also when you are in a chaotic situation where you feel like you're drowning you're not programmed to turn around and say, are you okay? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So I think that's it. Why don't we, um, why don't we wrap up and uh, high five each other? And psh, I think we stoned that bird a lot. <laughs> that bird is stoned. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh huh. Oh, have you seen the memes that have been coming out? Um, yes. That, that yeah. we've been producing. We're putting the bird in other people's memes. It's, it's the little things that just make me smile you should uh tag me more often on some of these linkedin things all right i I know to see them in real time because my dozens and dozens of followers yes your dozens and dozens of followers take up so much of your time yeah (laughs) all right brother well uh good times looking forward to hanging out again soon Hey, and thanks for joining us for the TSOB podcast. Find us on LinkedIn and give us your hot take. The whole reason we're doing this is to get access to better conversations that help us up our game. And if you have something you want to share, we want to hear about it. Find us on the TSOB LinkedIn group and jump in with two feet. We can't wait to chat.